sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I have to make three announcements. Um, the first one is um, tomorrow there will be actually another inclusion at RSS lunch. Um, it's, a, uh, it's planned to be an open lunch to anyone in the RSS community who is from an underrepresented group, including not limited and not limited to women, LGBTQ+, underrepresented minorities and people with disabilities as well as their allies. I need to read this because it's kind of like an English term that I didn't know. So um, it's going to take place in um, room number 10 that is behind the uh, registration to the right upstairs. It's nice and cool over there, and it's going to be a first come, first serve, I guess, but leave space to the actual people who are supposed to be there as well. Um, good. So this was the first announcement. The second one um, regards, uh, I'm typically going to ask, uh, or get applause for this conference. It's actually not me who is the supposed to get this. It's Bettina Schuk. She is on the way. Uh, typically, when you go to this lunch or to the registration desk, she typically hides behind the desk over there. She has organized everything. If you run into her, like say hello to her, say thank you to her, complain to me, and give her a hug or do whatever you want. Uh, but please do it. OK, and the third one. Reg The third one regards the banquet tonight. I want to put this in here because maybe you want to have this invited speak, uh, speech in a few seconds and then people run out for poster sessions and so on. Dinner tonight will be, the banquet tonight will be in the Concert House, Freiburg. Um, it's um, supposed to be the tram stop Stadttheater. Actually, when you look at the map, the tram stop on top of the railways or the rails, like on that bridge, it looks closer but there's a construction in a spiral staircase that you cannot go where you cannot go down. So the suggestion is you take the tram towards Stadttheater, tram lines one to five, stop over there. If you go to from here, it's tram line number four. And um, basically, you need to go backwards in the direction of travel, approximately 500 meters, and then make a left, and there will be the entrance. OK, so hope you're going to find it. Uh, see you there. And we're now going to continue with the next session. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, my name is Han Lim Choi uh, from KAIST, South Korea, and uh, I'm chairing this yeah, interesting session 10, uh, which uh, consists of inter yeah, five interesting papers that deal with uh, yeah, uh, in presenting yeah, nice ideas to deal with high dimensionality and the uncertainty in the robotics uh, problems. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, give some yeah, ask all the yeah, speakers to come to the front. So because yeah. Uh, yeah, for the yeah, microphone setup. Okay, so so we uh, let's start with the first paper. The, fir uh, the first paper to be presented is uh, a two approximation algorithm for the online tethered coverage problem. Uh, this is a work done by authors in Kent, Univers Kent State University and the University of North uh, Florida. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, none of the authors uh, was not able to make it to the conference because of the visa issue. But instead, they sent us the uh, nice video. So let's first watch their video and, yeah. yeah, please. Hello, my name is Ayan Datta, and I'm going to talk about our paper on a two approximation algorithm for the online tethered coverage problem. We assume the environment to be polygonal. It is discretized into cells of size D by D. The robot is assumed to be of the same size. The robot is attached to a fixed base point, a cell in the environment with a cable of length L. Initially, the environment is unknown to the robot. Obstacles might occupy some of the cells. The robot will have to detect and avoid them on the fly while covering all the free cells such that the travel cost is minimized. The main idea is to build a tree map on the fly, having the base station as the root of the tree. The numbers on the cells indicate the Manhattan distances called contours from the base station to each cell. The robot follows a depth first search from the station while building the tree dynamically. If the cable does not reach a cell in the environment, the robot will backtrack from there. 
From S, the not cell will be visited first and will be added as a child node of S. Next, the not cell of this cell, which is contour 2, left column, third row from the bottom, will be added as a child node of the contour 1 node. The cells occupied by obstacles will not be added to the tree. One sample environment and its corresponding tree map can be seen on the right. As the tree does not contain any cycle, we can exclusively avoid the tangling of the cable by following a tree traversal for the coverage. Our algorithm guarantees a two approximation. This is a significant improvement from the state of the art of 2L over D approximation. As can be seen, our approximation result does not depend on any parameter of the model. The proofs can be found in the paper. We have also shown that for certain scenarios, the two approximation bound is optimal. A sample scenario is illustrated on the right, where the robot first will go north and have to come back to the base point before it can cover the rest of the environment. We have tested our approach in simulation on a desktop computer on five different configurations, which can be seen in the next slide. We have validated our theoretical two approximation bound in the test cases as well. As can be seen in the figure on the top right, our proposed approach outperforms the state of the art algorithm for the same problem in terms of path length covered by the robot. Runtime is another performance metric in our test cases. Results show that the runtime is negligible for large environments. For example, our algorithm takes only 150 seconds to completely cover a 400 by 400 environment. As expected, with higher percentage of obstacles, the length of the traverse paths to cover the environment and corresponding runtimes go down. Here you can see the test environments and the corresponding paths followed by the robot to cover it. We are sorry to not be able to present physically at the conference. We would like to thank you all for attending our talk. Okay, thank you for the authors. And uh, so they tried to send us the posters, but the, yeah, it was sent to you for, uh, via search mail, but it has not uh, arrived yet. So if you have questions, then yeah, please email uh, the authors. Okay, so, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Ashkan Zarsu uh, from MIT, and he's going to talk about a risk contours map for risk bounded motion planning under perception uncertainties. Hello everyone. In this work, we introduced risk contours map for risk-bounded planning under perception uncertainties. In this problem, we have probabilistic uncertainties in location, size, and geometry of obstacles. And we define risk as a probability of collision of robot with such uncertain obstacles in the environment. Now, in such framework, and instead of working with an ordinary map that only shows free and obstacle regions, we suggest due to lack of precise information of obstacles, we construct a new map that we call a risk contours map. Such map represents risk information of different regions in the environment. To construct such map, we define the notion of delta risk contour, which, which is a set of all points in the environment whose risk is less than or equal to delta. Then risk contours map would be a collection of such delta risk contours with different risk levels delta as shown here. Now, we can use such map in risk-bounded motion planning. In risk-bounded motion planning, we are looking for a trajectory PT to connect the given initial and goal points in the state space. And due to uncertainties, we have probabilistic safety constraint. Probability of collision of trajectory with uncertain obstacles in the environment should be bounded by predefined value delta. Now, we can replace this probabilistic constraint with deterministic constraints in terms of delta risk contours of obstacle. And as a result, we can call any motion planning algorithm like RRT star or PRM to construct the trajectory. 
As shown here, we only need to make sure that obtained trajectory is always inside the delta risk counters of the obstacles. Now, in this work, we are going to provide a general and systematic numerical procedure to construct delta risk counters for given uncertain obstacles. We describe such obstacles with the polynomial level sets with uncertain vector omega. In general, such uh, set represents a non-convex obstacle with probabilistic uncertainties in the environment. And also, probabilistic technique is general, and it can deal with both bounded and unbounded probability distributions of uncertainties. And it only uses a finite sequence of the moments of probability distributions to construct delta risk counters. Constructing delta risk counters is challenging. From its definition, we need to deal with probabilistic constraint. Here we have a multivariate integral with respect to probability distributions of uncertainties over non-convex region of obstacles. In general, such integral doesn't have any analytical solution, and hence it's challenging to deal with. The main idea in this work is to find a polynomial approximation of such probabilistic constraint and use its level sets to represent delta risk counters. More precisely, we are going to find a polynomial such that its delta sublevel sets represents the inner approximation of the delta risk counters, as shown here. And similarly, we are, we are going to find a polynomial such that its 1 minus delta super level sets represent ultra approximation of the delta risk counters of the problem. And to find such polynomials, we are going to leverage theory of measures and theory of moments, and also theory of sum of squares polynomials. And we are going to provide a convex optimization in the form of semi-definite program to construct such polynomials. We also show that as the order of polynomials increases, these inner and outer approximations converge the true delta risk counters of the problems. We have different set of examples, like planning in presence of human cr crowd that behaves randomly. Happy to discuss e these examples and also mathematical details in the poster session. Thank you. Thank you, Ashkan, for a nice presentation. Uh, next, uh, so we will bring uh, Dr. Liu again. Yeah, for the second paper, he <coughs> in this session, uh, the Pareto Monte Carlo tree search for multi-objective informative planning. Thanks. Hello, I'm Lan Chao again from Indiana University. Yep. So uh, this work is about uh, the informative informative planning that optimizes over multiple heterogeneous and even competing objectives. So in order to real-time estimate an underlying environment model by limited data collected by robots, the informative planning has been widely used where the, mean, the basic idea is to, uh, to optimize one important objective, the information gain. However, in many scenarios, there are multiple concurrent objectives, such as the boundary tracking, extreme tracking, and also the uh, risk aversion. So the key idea of this work is to or integrate the Pareto optimality into the Monte Carlo tree search. And we assume that uh, the robot can choose from a set of a primitive paths along which the data samples can be collected. And to better describe the idea, we assume the task has only two objectives. One is to quickly explore the unknown environment by using the information gain maximization as a U-roll. And the other objective is to carefully exploit the space by collecting more samples around a significant uh, uh, target value. So each point here is a vector, and that represents the accumulated uh, objective value for a, a trajectory, for a path. And the red points dominate the black points because they have larger values in both dimensions. And the red points are called Pareto optimal, and they represent equally best choices. So as a non-myopic planner, the Monte Carlo tree search not only considers about the current primitive path, but also takes future observations into account and build, build a, a tree incrementally. So the search process can be broken down into four steps. First, the selection, where the best expandable node is searched recursively following some predefined selection policy. 
And from there, then we can attach one child, new child node to the obtained expandable node. And then we can perform a simulation from that node in order to get a vector of reward where each value of the vector represents the accumulated objective value for each objective. And that re re vector reward is back propagated to the node visited. And that can bias the node selection step in the next round. And these four steps repeat until the time budget is used. So to address the potentially competing objectives, such as the exploration of the unknown and the exploitation of the known, uh, we model the problem using the multi-objective, multi-armed bandit problem. And we proved that uh, the number of times for choosing the bad or suboptimal nodes can be logarithmically bounded, and the search can converge to optimal solution at a polynomial rate. So to summarize, our informative planner allows, allows multiple heterogeneous and even competing objectives, and we have integrated the Pareto optimality with the Monte Carlo tree search to uh, achieve the real-time in-situ non-myopic decision, uh, sampling decision making, and we provide the bound two. So here are some results. The three green blobs represent the hot spot that are initially unknown to the robots. The two simulations at the bottom uh, employ the Pareto Monte Carlo tree search with, optimal, with multiple objectives. And we can see that uh, this shows desired behavior where the robot first quickly explore the environment to discover the hot spots, after which more effort is spent in examining more details around the discovered hot spots. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alanta, again for the nice uh, speech. And uh, the next uh, paper to be presented today is a uh, hierarchical geometry framework to design locomotive gates for highly articulated robots. Uh, the work done by yeah, people in Georgia Tech and CMU and uh, Bakshi Zong will be presenting their work. Hello everyone, I'm here, I'm Bashi, I'm here to present our work on hierarchical geometric framework. Before we start, let's have a quick review on geometric mechanics. Geometric mechanics maps the shape velocity to body velocities. The mapping leads to a height function from which we can intuitively design gates. In previous work, we use basis function to simplify high dimensional systems. We reduce the dimension from Rn to R2. In more complicated system, we can decompose the high dimensional systems into many motion subsystems. For example, if we consider a quadrupedal robot with elongated body, it can generate self-propulsion from leg movement, uh, which, is which can be considered as one of motion sub subsystems. It can also generate self-propulsion from the upper back and lower back uh, body undulations, which can also be motion subsystems. In this way, we can decompose the whole body motion into many um, motion subsystems. In other words, uh, we reduce the dimension from Rn to Tm. Recall that the shape space for T2 is a torus, a gate that wraps around the torus. And in the unfolded Euclidean shape space, we can analyze the um, uh, intuitively interpret the meaning of the uh, contribution from the individual and the contribution from the coordination. And with some mathematic tricks, and we can also visually interpret the meaning of the contribution from individual and the contribution from the coordination. So let's go back to our example. Um, we first, I was, um, before we present our gaze design by our hierarchical geometric framework, let's first take a look at two um, conventional assumptions for the body undulations. Um, the first assumption is that the body undulation resembles a one for a three-link three -link swimmer, which means that the phase difference between the upper back and lower back is pi over two, a serpentoid wave. In this way, the self-proportion from the body is maximized. The leg movement can be mm, um, properly designed to coordinate with the uh, serpentoid uh, body undulation. As you can see from the video, the gait under serpentoid body undulation can lead to solid displacement. Next. Um, the second conventional assumption is that the body undulation resembles a one as a lizard, which means that the phase difference between the upper back and lower back is zero, a standing wave. 
the leg movement um, is properly coordinated with the um, standing wave uh, body undulation. And um, in this way, the self, the self propulsion from the leg movement um, is, um, is maximized. As you can see from the, vi from the video, the gates uh, under standing wave assumption can lead to solid displacement. Then the question arises, how does it compare to the uh, serpenoid wave assumptions? And we, can we do better than these two conventional assumptions? So the next step, we apply our hierarchical geometric framework to design gates for our quadrupedal robot with elongated body. We decouple the upper back and lower back and treat them as two independent motion subsystems. So after the optimization, it turns out that the optimal body undulation is somewhere between the serp serpenoid wave and the standing wave. The phase difference between the upper back and lower back is pi over four, as is shown on the right video from this. And um, we test our theory on robot and the robot experiment uh, verified our theory. Finally, we sampled all the uh, spatial phases all the way from the standing wave to serpentoid wave. As you can see from the plot, Uh, both the simulation and the robot experiments verify our uh, theoretical prediction. And um, thanks for listening. And if you have a question, please email me or come to our poster. Thank you. Okay, so now we will have a Q&A session. So I ask or, or the three speakers uh, to come on the stage. So we have less number of speakers in this session than the others, but which means that you can ask yeah, more, more, more questions and the discussion will be more uh, interactive and active, I think. Okay, so any questions? I, I got a question. Okay. So for the Pareto Mount Color Tree Search, um, can you elaborate what is the key difference between this and uh, partially observable UCT or known as Palm CP? Well, um, so we ha so currently we ha we uh, have not investigated for the partially observable case. So honestly, I don't have a quick answer to that. But that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, we would like to uh, to kind of uh, do more research on that kind of direction. Okay, so I have a question about paper number three. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the difference? of your approach compared to a convolution of an occupancy grid map and planning in a convolved map? The risk map, you mean? Yeah, just a map which you convolve yeah. with the kernel okay, and so then plan the that map. Okay, the existing methods are mainly limited to Gaussian uncertainties and linear and convex description of the obstacles. But here, so we are general, we don't have such limitations. So we can deal with nonlinear, non-convex regions, almost arbitrary probability distribution. And also we provide a systematic numerical procedure. So we formulate this problem as a standard chance constraint optimization and then leverage the techniques. This is the main difference. But couldn't you, con couldn't you convolve with a non-Gaussian kernel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have a question for this. All right, I have a question for the same here. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I have a question for the uh, same speaker. Um, I really like the idea of this having you know, risk boundaries, but I'm wondering whether the, this risk boundary should depend on the dynamics of the vehicle, or if it is a vehicle, as well as its geometry and other things, right? Yeah, so this is a good question. So in general, we have two main sources of uncertainties. The one that comes from environment, and the other one that comes from the system itself, dynamics. Here we only consider the environment uncertainties, and in fact, we are generating nominal risk boundary trajectories for the robot to follow. Then in the next step, when we are designing controllers, we can consider dynamics and uncertainties of the system itself to follow these generated uh, trajectories. Sorry to uh, uh, ask the uh, same uh, question, uh, same uh, speaker. Uh, there are a variety of notions of risk. Uh, so is your framework uh, 
uh, for like confidence intervals or chance constraints, or you can do also like conditional value at risk and other kinds of risk notions. There are a variety of risk metrics out there. Right. So we are here. So we here. Uh, so using the 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 standard formulation of the risk. So given probability distribution and some regions, how we can find the probability of let's say collision. But we can generate these techniques to other notion of the risk. Uh, hi, sorry to pick on the same speaker again, but uh, I was just wondering if you could um, maybe try to draw some uh, similarities or differences between what you presented in like stochastic reachability. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. Sorry, I I'm asking if there are any um, similarities or differences um, between your work and like stochastic reachability. Yeah, right. So in the reachability, so we need to deal with we need to deal with dynamics and its uncertainty. So we can actually use the same methodology to find the reachability sets given the nonlinear dynamics and the nonlinear different uh, uncertainties. So it's kind of the same. I'm actually addressing this problem in my other papers, how we can use the same methodology to find a forward and inverse reachability set, set of nonlinear system. Yeah, any further questions from the audience? Okay, then so uh, I have a question for uh, Baxi. So, so, uh, so you in your the the snake and the lizard-like uh, gaze, then you yeah the optimized yeah kind of the phase difference between the yeah, upper uh, the front bag and the back, uh, uh, rear bag is yeah something you optimized and the so is that. Oh yeah, pi over four uh, phase difference is that a function of the the actual inertial parameters of the the the, the robot or yeah, this is a function of the uh, the aspect ratio of the leg size and body size. Mm -hmm. So that's our one of the uh, application in our paper is like maybe during the course of evolution, uh, while the uh, nimbleness test of lizard or snake can can um, is uh, accompanied by this. Uh, Changes in the aspect ratio and the their how it moves. So then, how's the uh, uh, yeah? How complex is the optimization process? Is there yeah, for the, the so you th yeah you are the, the the last result is yeah the optimized uh, motion. Then so how how difficult is the optimization problem? So is it simple uh, like the if you uh, we are given the the aspect ratio, then we know the answer or you have to run a yeah, pretty complicated optimization well, it, It's pretty fast, and uh, mm -hmm. also we can visually see the contributions from, like, um, the coordination contribution from individuals, so it's pretty fast. And uh, I, uh, I have a, a question for yeah, Lantau, so about the, yeah, your yeah, the Parido uh, Monte Carlo tree search, so, uh, so so we, the, the informative planning can be multi-objective and uh, if we have more, uh, multiple objective to uh, deal with then, uh, so cheap then, so, but eventually, so uh, the, does your algorithm provide uh, just one path or multiple set of the, all the Pareto, path, uh, Pareto solutions? Well, so the question is uh, whether it's a one, eventually one path or multiple paths, yeah. right, choose from. The goal is to, uh, to of course, is one path, that's the quick answer, and we, uh, so we targeted at combining or integrating multiple kind of competing kind of objectives together. Yeah, in that way, then uh, we can uh, kind of balance between the competition between objectives. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is different from uh, the kind of the weighting uh, scheme, like we have the alpha beta kind of put on the, uh, the coefficient, because that one, well, people can just tune that thing. Mm -hmm. But we want the, the, the kind of the planning scheme choose that kind of the, you know, the, the balancing mm -hmm. effort itself in that way, for the exploration case, we want first probably the we, the robots need to explore, put more effort on the exploration. Mm. Later on, then after the exploration is done, then we might want the robot to focus more on the exploiting mm. exploitation. So in that way, then also if we put we use the like a coefficient way, then uh, it might be challenging. So that's kind of one uh, motivation. So so the the, uh, <laughs> the your solution is guaranteed to be a Pareto optimum. And uh, but the weighting is basically the adjusted by the algorithm rather than you put yeah fix the uh, the give a yeah, specified value is that the right intuitively we might think that way okay yeah, intuitively okay yeah so yeah let's think again 
uh, for the speakers and the nice presentation and the discussions.